Oh, welcome back. Um, now we have to continue from the lecture we left off. This is the International Petroleum Agreements class. Uh, we covered last time, um, still on the subject of definitions. Remember, that was the language of agreements we were talking about that we have to talk about before we go forward. This essentially is part, uh, part one of the four part course on uh, petroleum concessions and agreements, okay? Very likely, very, my, we will be finishing part one today. Uh, <clears throat> if we have the time, we will be moving to part two. In part two, we'll discuss the different types of agreements, petroleum agreements, of course, exploration production agreements. There are many kinds of agreements. We told only about the exploration production agreement that mostly geologists and engineers and geophysicists come across. Uh, so this is, a, as I said, um, we'll be moving to different types of agreements uh, around the globe as part two. Very likely we'll start with part two. I want part two when it starts, the first, the, it should continue uh, today. And then uh, we, we will move to, there are four parts to part two, the four separate sections and different types of agreements. I hope to cover two sections of part uh, two, okay? You will always finish part one definition. The types of agreement part two, and we plan to cover two sections of it, there are a total of four within that part, okay? Anyway, that's just to give you some idea where we are in the course. Uh, last time, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, we touched on a few subjects like what are reserves, to find them, we talked about, uh, what else did we talk about? Carried interest, uh, who should declare commerciality? Should it be the government or the company? And I gave you the reason why I favored the, the company declaring that the project is, is commercial and because they have the data, they have the interest rate that they paid to the bank. So the, and the, the, pro, the project has to make more money than they pay the bank, the interest rate, of course versus the rate of return. And therefore they, they should be the one entitled to determine whether it is commercial or not. At that point, when the, the project moves from the exploration phase to the development and production phase, okay? That is when the government generally comes in and starts paying its share of the costs. And of course they receive its share of the revenues, okay? And then we talked about determination with work programs, of course, uh, was another topic uh, which was to be dependent on many factors. Uh, I just listed three to give you an idea and the infrastructure, whether it is there or not. The geography has to be there, whether it is not. And of course, the infrastructure, geology and the geography, okay. Um, and of course, geology, if it is complex, it'll take a while to interpret it. And if it has scores, and which have to be sent to a laboratory somewhere, and uh, you have to get in line because the other companies are sending their, their, their cores for, for analysis. And so that may slow down the process itself. Okay. But the government would want the work program to proceed quickly. They have to recognize some of them limitation that I just listed. We talked about uh, applicable law, yes. Which law will apply to the agreements and uh, foreign exchange provision, I said, I talked about, I think Lima, Peru. Companies do not like to leave too much of the, their hard earned money, their own profits in local currency. Mm, but they like to take it out in hard currencies of euros and dollars and, um, Norwegian kroners, which is in a currency. Interestingly, euro, the word euro, E-U-R-O, is a, is a currency which evolved, uh, I forget, probably 15, 20 years back, because before that we had different currencies named, named were different in different countries. In Germany, we had the German marks, and in France, we had the French francs, francs, Italy, there were the Liras. These company, countries got together and said, we should have one country. You see, otherwise they were 
when you know Europe, everybody's very close together in countries. So when they were moving from one country to another, they had to convert the currency into the local currencies currency and they pay every time the foreign exchange and that got to be uh, not only cumbersome you know, every time you could the, the agency that is converting from one currency to another as uh, you're moving across borders uh, in Europe you had to pay so they said no that's going to take uh, this a group of countries are normally they're probably 12 or 13 uh, and that we have a common currency so you can move from Italy to use a, and use euro to France and use euro and move to Germany use the same euro. However, some countries like Nor Norway abstained from joining that group and therefore their country still is called whatever it was called in the past is the kroner, K-R-O-N-E-R, -E okay? So that was about foreign exchange provision and so on. There are a couple of three and cost recovery, as I said, uh, all costs that are incurred to do business uh, are allowed to be taken out and you don't pay tax on those. And I will give you the, the example of taking me to dinner and we discuss the oil project. And so those costs will have to be taken out and not pay any tax on it. It's legal and there are accounting procedures and that are established in the agreements, in fact, uh, Agreements have uh, an accounting for a little tick big that tells you how to recover different costs. And I think I mentioned that last time. Having said that, uh, and then we talk about delay rentals. I'm just looking up the thing we talked about that if you want to keep the lease, meaning you in the company, they have you have to pay the, the, the fee, the rent to keep it beyond the first year. Generally speaking, first year, the government can let you have it free of cost no rent, but after one year, the government wants you to relinquish, give up uh, the portion, the acreage, the block, uh, which you don't want and not have to pay any rental on that. Okay. So that uh, essentially were the, some of the things uh, we talked about. But there's some very important subjects are still left and one of them is a norm price. Let's write down norm price. Every agreement has a reference to a norm price. Again, if I were lecturing, I'd say, you tell me what is a norm price. Some people say, oh, it's a normal price. Oh, what's a normal price? And oh, it's this price is the market price. Oh, it's the price set by OPEC. No, it's not none of those. There goes your 10 minutes discussion right there. And I'm going to get to the point, save the 10 minutes. And write it down. I'll speak slowly this time. Norm price is a, it's laid down in the contract, is the price that is used, it is agreed to price between the oil companies and the governments. Norm price is the price that is used to calculate all payments to the government. That's all. You have to pay the government royalty. The government has to be paid uh, corporate tax. All these have to have a norm price to establish how much royalty will go to the government and how much corporate tax the government will receive. So let's talk a little bit more about norm price. Again, What's the norm price and what do we talk about? What, what changes the price of oil? All these are questions can be discussed. I'll keep it short to the point. Of course, price of oil or any other commodity is a function of supply and demand and other factors too. 
if you were to attend my attend uh, my class finance class i spent a full lecture on talking about oil price i wish you were because my, i have a very unique approach to talk about oil price unlike others at one time when i was in the boat my i've had two experiences in real life before this teaching experience which has extended for decades first was the utility in, in um, department a power generation and then i switched to banking in both this areas of utilities and banking i had a very very important responsibility to forecast the price of oil i talk in the 70s and the early 80s because the utilities and not only oil also of coal per million btu is generally in mid million of btus that you you price uh, oil and gas because at the end of the day you're not buying oil or gas you are buying a heat content that is contained in that commodity and also the price of u308 in the nuclear fuel cycle it all starts with u308 then you can enrich it and convert it and put it into the reactor but so you first buy this yellow cake yellow is the color called u308 by the pound and then i was involved in forecasting price of gas why or they needed because the big comp- this side benefit this is education beyond just agreements the biggest component in your electricity bill in the electricity bill there is the how much electricity did you use and the charge you accordingly and the kilowatt hour for example is the amount of electricity used the biggest component is the cost of the fuel that went into generating the electricity i would say 60 70 80% is the cost of fuel therefore forecasting what the price of the fuel either coal or gas or nuclear fuel would be in the future would have a big importance as it will dictate whether you want to put a plant electric plant based on nuclear oil or gas as a source of energy to generate the steam that goes into the turbine that generates the electricity so that was very important so if over the next 20 30 years i did the forecast that the price of gas is going to be relatively low compared to coal or vice versa or the coal price is going to be relatively low over the next 20 years then the utility that i served build a coal plant which takes then took about 7 7 8 years to build because it's going to save a lot of money on the fuel cost similarly for nuclear what is the cost of nuclear fuel i did the forecast because nuclear uh, plants at that time took what 10 12 14 years the one i was involved in called the south texan nuclear project i was on the committee from which we get in austin electricity we get it from there 16% of the plant is ours meaning your and mine we could electricity department here is a public meaning public in the sense there is a municipality of which we are the owners individually as taxpayers so if if i did forecast them the nuclear fuel is going to be inexpensive though relative to oil or coal then we would go we the utility would put put a nuclear plant which we did and we had the oil plant and the coal plant and the nuclear plant depending on what the forecast said was the price of this fuel versus that so i was involved in that while it banking same thing i was the so called the technical advisor to the bank not the real bank banking kind of a guy that looked at interest rates and so on I had nothing to do with charging interest rate from the to the borrower there i had to ascertain determine what is the value of oil in the ground to serve, which serves as a security for 
how much loan to give based on that as security, the oil in the ground, how much is the value so that the bank can give the loan according to that value. That value is simply a function of two things, the amount of oil in the ground times the price of oil in the ground now and to the future. That was my job again, to forecast the price of oil. So I've done this business for quite a while from the real world. And you can be surprised, shocked, to know that I have never, never, never seen, met, or read about anybody yet who did not make, who, who came out right on the price of oil and gas and so on. Not one individual, including myself. Were I Mr. Wright? No. Did I know anybody? No. Do I still know somebody? No, not an individual. None of these big kind of bankers and uh, oil company people, none of them have any idea. So the question is why not? Why did they all go wrong? That is part of my lecture, which is a two hours and 30 minute lecture only why did we go wrong in forecasting our price and can we for oil and gas and so on? Will we ever get it right? So you'll have to listen to that lecture. Basically, if I can make it a short one, little, little, so I've raised your curiosity, I know that. That's the way I teach, raise curiosity so you keep paying attention. The many factors which caused us to be wrong, one was simply, which I discovered later on now, the, 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 whenever there was a major change in the price of oil, and I'll give you some landmarks, they were all geopolitically related, all of them. I'll give you an example. In 1973, there was a war between the Arabs and the Israelis called the Yom. Y U M, I believe it. Yom Y U M, yeah, or O M, Kippur. K I P P U R, Yom Kippur War. Big event in the history of the world. In many ways. And the result of that war, overnight, the price of oil jumped from $3 to $12. Look it up in the Google if you want. 100 years before 1973, for 100 years before 73, the price of oil was constant for 100, it was $3 a barrel. Same, no, $3.10, $2.90. 100 years, no change. Look it up from any source. Suddenly, now the price of oil jumps from $3 to 12. 100 years constant. You will agree that a war is a geopolitical event, isn't it? Yes, it is. So then what happens? To 1979, price of oil stayed around there, $12 or so. In 1979, another major geopolitical event happened. And that was the Iranian revolution you may have read about. You're too young to remember it because you weren't born probably most of you. Where the Shah of Iran abdicated the throne and there was a revolution with and the, and the, the religious leader Khomeini came and landed in Tehran, the capital of Iran. Consequently, in a very short time, I mean, literally short time, months, the price of oil went from $12 to $24. Geopolitical, from three to 12 to 12 to 24, eight times, golly man, unbelievable. Then what happened? 
I won't draw the whole map. That's a two and a half, uh, all this graph. That's a long period to take it over, covered in 1991, I believe, with 1241. When I believe that was the period, I forget the dates. I think it was Gulf War One when Saddam invaded Kuwait and then um, we went to war and there was George Bush, the president, senior president, George Bush, and the price of oil shot up to $40 a barrel, like this. So again, a geopolitical war, geopolitical. So what am I saying by these three events that I've cited? that every time we saw a major dramatic change in the price of oil, at that time, the underlying factor in every instance was geopolitical. That makes for forecasting oil price almost impossible. Why? Because Nobody that I can imagine can forecast a geopolitical event. No matter what kind of a computer you have, it doesn't matter. No matter how long an equation that feeds into the computer to tell you when the price, of, when the war will happen between the Arabs and Israel, there is no such computer program or modeling. But yet, well, you cannot ascertain, determine when the war will take place when the Arabs. How can you rely and say no? Because the, the price of oil jumped from three to 12 based on that war. You can't guess when the war will happen. No computer is there to tell us whether it will happen. Therefore, you can't guess when the price of oil would, would jump from three to 12 because they're interconnected. Who, what computer model will tell us that the king of Iran would be abdicating the throne in 97. No such model existed. Does not exist, cannot, a geopolitical event. So again, we don't know when these geopolitical events can happen or will happen. So how can we rely on this computer that is supposed to forecast geopolitical, but it can't. There's no equation that is so complex that it can tell uh, when the, the, the religious person, uh, a scholar or uh, uh, will land in, um, Iran, similarly with, can you, can any, can imagine, say I can, how Saddam Hussein used to think, if you know who Saddam is or was, no. How can we put the equation in the computer to tell us when Saddam will invade Kuwait? There's no way. So these are the points, the geopolitical events, the impossible, not difficult, impossible to predict. Yet the price of oil is connected with it. So that's a major impact or a problem with regard to determining or forecasting the price with some accuracy. I hope you're getting my message. This just a little opening up on oil price behavior. So I'm talking about non-price. Non-price or any price is a function not only of politics, also on supply and demand. And price of anything is a function of supply and demand. It's basic, I don't have to repeat that. Now, the other factor that I'm going to talk about and write on the board that determine the price of oil. Let me write maybe two. Can you tell me what are they? Wish I was in the class and we could have a long discussion. It would be a very interesting lecture. One is, I'm getting to the point, is the quality of the oil. 
Norm prime is a function of so many things. Let's limit the quality. If I write too deep, then it's difficult erasing it. And it's still wet because I'm using the, the liquid here to clean the board. So I may rewrite it a little darker once it's not wet, it dries up. Let's see if it's already dried up quality. It's almost like a, it's almost like a, a shadow. This is dirty. This is uh, liquid. Clean liquid is not to my hand. No, how no? You're going to tell me a quality function of what? The sulfur content, it is a function of API gravity. API gravity is the inverse, is opposite of specific gravity. Go to your high school class and learn what is a specific gravity or also called relative density, uh, specific gravity. The higher the API gravity, the lower the specific gravity and vice versa. Okay. Sulfur, some content. If this oil has a lot of sulfur in it, not good. Sour. Sulfur. As you go up, and the quality of the sulfur improves. It is called sweet. The scale from sour, sour to sweet, and vice versa depends on the sulfur content. Some crude oils or sulfur content, high sulfur. Some are sweet sulfur, less sulfur, okay? Now, that will have an impact on the price of oil, of course, it's copious. Gravity is, as I said, high gravity, uh, API gravity is poor quality. No, 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 no. If you get high gravity of 40 degrees, API is in degree, it's very good quality oil. Now I would think uh, Libyan oil, Saudi oil, I don't know exactly the gravity is moderately high, where the Venezuelan oil is pretty bad. It doesn't flow. It has a very low API gravity, 15, 17 degree API gravity. Okay. So here we are. If you have high API gravity, high, it's a good oil, it's called light, light crude. Low API gravity is high, is well, heavy crude oil, light and heavy. So you can already tell that non price could be a function of any of the combination of these four items and more. Now, what is the other factor that affects the price of crude oil besides the supply and demand and all that stuff? Well, 
put it down. Now the second question is location. Oh, what about location? There could be um, location could be in the field at the well site. Okay. Or it could be delivered, or it could be measured into. I'll give you what. It could be FOB or CIF. I'll explain all this. I don't know if it's still that I can't tell. The location could be at the well that is the cheapest or it could be FOB that is delivered free on board. Not free, uh, free on free on board. Yes, most oil is priced as FOB. Not all, but most of it is internationally. I'm talking about free on board. What? Free on board the cargo vessel, the tanker. That is, when the the price, the cost of moving the oil from the wellhead is added to putting it on the vessel at the port. That oil on the vessel set to sail, not sail, right at the port, is, is, is quoted as free on board the cargo or vessel, also called oil tanker. The most oil is priced as FOB. Then there is CIF, you see the CIF? Remember, I um, see if I you can read it. Yeah, I'll move this away. CIF is CIF. Free on board is this. AP gravity is this. Sulfur content is this. This is for C is cargo. Plus insurance. Plus freight. Cargo insurance freight. That is what the oil price per barrel is. To so that you add that the insurance. You know, when you move oil from the port before it departs to when it arrives to, in, in Japan from Saudi Arabia, there has to be an insurance. So you add the insurance cost to the cost of fuel oil in Saudi Arabia. And then, of course, you had what to add it? The freight that is the cost of transportation that is called freight. So. When you talk about cargo insurance or freight is CIF, you want to know that will be the delivered. Delivered price of oil in, 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 in Japan or China or in North Korea or in, wherever you want it. Port of 
delivery point is. So, wellhead is in the well, at the, at the wellhead, meaning in the field. FOB is before the oil departs Saudi Arabia. And CIF is when the cargo or oil arrives in Japan. So this is how there are different ways to price oil as I've cited you here. So when we talk about non price, it gets a little more complex as you can see, you're looking at the, the quality and the sulfur content, the AP gravity and other factors I'm making it simple. When we talk about location, it's FOB, it's CIF, well that and make a big difference. Generally speaking, oil is quoted in a price at FOB, whereas, uh, not always, natural gas in the form of LNG, you know, liquefied natural gas delivered in Tokyo or electric plant in Japan, is quoted as CIF. LNG per million BTU, you always refer to as million BTU, uh, uh, delivered in, in, uh, in the electric plant or the port in Japan would be quoted as a CIF, gas per million BTU from Australia or Malaysia, Qatar uh, or Indonesia. These are the four big exporters of LNG in the world on that side. The, the, that hemisphere to the east. In the western hemisphere, LNG, there are several others. There's Algeria, export a lot of LNG, and there's small, small exporters like Trinidad and Tobago and Nigeria and Equatorial Guinea. They're small, okay? Let's take this off. I hope and that when I wipe this off on the board by using a minimum liquid so it dries up that while I'm lecturing now it's drying up so I can write again so I've got to do some strategic planning here and to have a board ready and clean. Let's talk about control of operation definitions. Some required a discussion and explanation like this one I just did, and some do not. It's a one sentence. Control of operations is laid down in the agreement. One of the clauses says the company would control the operations or it might say the government will, con excuse me, control the operations. You have to write it down. Just assume this or that would be a, a, a folly, a mistake. One is obviously the case that when it's new, the company would want to take on the operations and the government wants to sit back and list, not sit back, you know, work with the company so that they get the experience, the government people get the experience. Sometimes, 
they hired the local people from Nigeria. Sometimes the, the company IOC worked with the NOC engineers, national company engineers, okay? And uh, they're technical people, so they learn from each other, hoping that one day, you know, the company may want to transfer all of the operations to the local people. I'm not saying you know, no, 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 the profits, just the operations. So we talked about is that local content in an early light. I'm trying to go through this list here to make sure that there is no subject that is left unfinished or not addressed. I'm looking at uh, another item we need to address before I get to the last one. Is what are the key issues and concerns of the government regarding the company? Hmm. And similarly, what are the company issues concerning the, the government? I'm just trying to make sure I don't miss that one here. Okay, this is this. Now this is the bank story. Give me one second now. Finance Monors and all for the agreement. It's okay. The government has many concerns which can kind of uh, company they want to bring in. You just, like like a resume, and you know, like anybody hiring anybody, don't you have concern, is this the right person you're hiring? And what are the yardsticks and how do you tell he's the right person or not? No, this is the way to do it. The company's concern, or let, let's talk about, uh, if you want to, the government concern about the company, let's talk about that. What are the government concern? What are they looking for? Many things, many things, many, we'll just reduce it to two or three, just to save time. One thing the government wants to know is the company's track record, uh, very important. Their experience, what have they done in the past? How successful has the company been in the past? Show us the results. What have they found? And how have they behaved in other countries? Did they get along with the government always? Or is there always a dispute? Because we have to discuss what dispute resolution is a part of this course, which will go on the miscellaneous part, you know, where I throw in everything that I haven't taught in any of the four parts I throw in the miscellaneous. Dispute resolution will fall there, generally it's after part three. That's an important thing. Show us your record, show us your experience. Another one would be, and if you're writing it down, I can write it, but it'll save us time if you write it down. I want to save time, I want to pack stuff here. The financial soundness of the company. How financially strong are they? Are they going to start a project and run out of money in the middle and declare bankruptcy? Have they done it somewhere else? That's a serious concern. They may ask the company to produce the financial statements of the last five years that they have submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission. In the case of the United States, there's this there's a, there's a government body called Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. The companies have, all, all companies have, I may have mentioned that before, have to submit annually a report to them. How much oil do they have? And how much money do they have? And you know, so the point here is the government needs to do all that good stuff. Hoping to pick the right candidate to look for oil. Can you give me another idea? In time for an open discussion in a classroom. Young men, young women, students come up with all kinds of ideas. We discuss them, go on and on. 
open my mind and their mind. But here we have limited time, so I'll add only one more. The company also would love to know what about the technical expertise. Slow down that you write on. It's easy for me to speak like this, but I like to slow down sometimes so you can catch up with the writing part of it. You're not going to get this in any book. 90% of it is all coming from my head here. The book you're going to buy is like a few pages. There's not much in that book. I would say I encourage you to buy it. Some part might be useful for it, for me, but what you're you listening is not a book thing. It's a real life thing I'm talking about. So don't say, well, if I miss this, I'll be in the book. No, 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 no. Focus on what I'm saying. Listen to me and take notes. And I hope I'm slow enough where you can follow me and also take notes. And uh, again, remembering that our students here whose language is not English, as a, from the country they come, also knowing there is a fear, and I'm, I'm trying to you know eliminate the fear, Just talking in a way that anybody can understand with minimum of background. There's no background needed. Is there anything so far I've said that you had to have some background in it? Very useful information. So again, getting back, the company wants to know, the government wants to know, what kind of a, what kind of a technical expertise do these fellows have? Okay. Geologists, do they have good geophysicists, reservoir engineers, production engineers, and on and on and on. on. Have you written that? Let's go on to the concerns of the government. Uh, no, no, concerns of the government. Sorry, apologize. I've just told you the three that is the track record of the company and the financial soundness of the company and the technical expertise. I've just told you that. Now let's move on to the other side, the mirror, the opposite. What are the concerns of the company going to into a country? Many, again, we will spend time only on three in the interest of time. This could be a several hour long lecture just on that and much more than three or four lectures and just we're going to put it in 10 minutes. The company is obviously concerned first and foremost, and they all look like the first and foremost, is the geology. We know, we've said it before, essentially the oil is found in sedimentary rocks and sedimentary basins. That's what you're looking for. When I asked around the world how many sedimentary basins are there in the world, they really told me, I'll tell you. Where, and I got, where did I get this information from? There are only 580, 580 sedimentary basins in the world that I know of, 580. Take a geology class to understand what is a sedimentary basin, not here. Essentially, that's the place where you can find oil putting it very simply. Who told me to tell you that? You can read it yourself. It's in a book called Giant Oil Fields of the World. So that's where I got this information. And the author is, I don't know, Giant Oil Field is Teratsu, T as in table, I, R, a, T as in table, S, O, O. Rasu is the author of the book. And that's why he says, well, according to him, some, and again, you know, he just, just pulled one number out there. You know, he did a lot of research and analysis and data collection. That's where he came up. You know what? Out of the 580 basins, so far, we, the geologists and so on, the scientists 
have only explored, I believe, have not explored, I know the other figure, you can minus that, have not explored 364 of these bases. So 580 minus 364, whatever the number is, have not been explored. The only data, and let me do the arithmetic. 580, you can do it. 364, 61, 24, 260, yeah. My math is correct. 64 make it 80, and three, yeah. We have only explored 200 of them. And 300 have not been explored. Additional 300. That means there is a lot of oil left to produce and find and produce because people talk running out of oil. No, we will not run out of oil. God knows for how long, many more years. Even if we don't find one barrel of oil more, there's enough oil to last my life and your life and your children's life, even if we don't find a barrel. You know how? The reserve to production ratio is quoted as nine or 10 years, that's for America, but that's not what it is. And yes, what if you don't find any more oil? If you don't find any more oil, there's plenty of oil still. So how is that possible, Dr. Murray? You guys, petroleum here, technical people, you know it. This oil that still is, is there, we know it and we can, we can get to it with only with one way. It's there, we know it. What? to technology, new ways to find, uh, to produce. An example, you should be the one teaching me this stage. You know, there's a primary recovery. You know that from a field. Who knows? 10, 12, 15% oil is produced. Maybe a little more in some cases, a little less in some cases. The remaining 80% is still in the ground. We know that. This is primary, the secondary, that is what? Primary, natural reasons that come up, pressure and all that. Then we have secondary water flood and all that stuff. That's another five to 10% oil comes out of there through water flooding, right? You should know, you're as a well engineer. There's no absolute number, these are relative numbers. So we still have about what? 60, 70% oil left in the ground still. You know it, it's there. Then we go to tertiary recovery. Thermal, miscible. You know thermal will be heat, you all make it less viscous and bring it to the surface. Then the five to 7% comes up to miscible. Ther thermal recovery is called tertiary, T-E-R-T-I-A-R-Y. Tertiary is the third bang, another 10%. All the technology we know now brings out maybe 40%, 45% in some fields, if you're very lucky. The rest of it is still there and we know it. That's why we have you smart engineers start working with this very nice professor on the technical side in our department and see how you can get to the remaining 50 or 60%. That's what research is about. So that's the point I wanted to make is, the company wants to know the geology. Are there reserves that, that only a primary production or we can go back and do it secondary and get some more oil? How advanced is this nation in that regard? And we can talk about that also. This is a new kind of agreement now. The old agreements was where everybody started the exploration, not now, some do and some go for increasing production, increasing, not finding oil, but increasing the production through technology. That's the new kind of agreements we sign all over the world. That's new. I will, I might, I probably will. I can talk about it even now, but I'd rather wait and let me see, maybe I'll do it now. Because I need to go to part two. And so I'm thinking whether to do it now or later, let's see how much. Um, okay, let's do it now. What am I talking about? Technology. In the past, the 
the only one kind of expression activity that the government offered or they, they knew about, so the companies went there, Exxon, Chevron, BP, and said, well, government, we want to look for oil here. They said, okay, come on down. So the company did everything. They did exploration, they did um, development, they did the production and everything from A to Z. They're still doing it. Companies are still doing it. Governments are still inviting them for that. And many countries, and I've been to them, Venezuela, Kazakhstan, Algeria, and others, they're saying to companies, come for exploration, but there is another way you can help us, is to bring your technology, bring your technology with you. Help us with your technology. And of course, your capital money. And what, what is that? I'll, I'll draw your graph. This is not happening in some countries. In all days, is, here is a country. You come down, look, explore for oil, drill for oil, find oil, drill it, produce it, take some, leave some. Some countries are saying that come for this. We already have found oil, they say. We are producing. National oil company says, the government people say, we are already producing the oil and Present. You can't read it. This is present. I don't know. Very difficult to find this. I, I really, I bought all of these that were in office department because most of them, 99% of these had chisel. You know, chisel, like a, like a chisel tip. And I don't like to write with a chisel tip. This way I can write chisel is like a, I don't know, like a wedge at the end, wedge, you know? Don't write. But that's what's in the market. So one shop I went to, they had three of these packages. And I said, give me all. So that's why if I did, if I had more and more and more, I'd throw this one away. I said, no, I can use the other black pen. It's only 50 cents, but it's not available. So therefore I have to, so this is present. So the production is this in the country from the field. And they're saying, in some cases, this is relatively new. These are the recent developments which are lecture at the end of the course. They said, today, come down here, Mr. Company, because if we don't do anything now, the production will go down like this. This. Don't, we, we don't do anything. We don't know the technology. We can't do anything. So the production will follow this curve. And now we want you to come company, bring your technology, you know, tertiary or water to flood or whatever you want to call it, and apply the technology that's today. So the decline curve moves from A to B graph. This is A, this is B. And the result is this much extra oil See this area, the shaded area. They said this much extra oil will be produced by extra, extra oil will be produced by B because thanks to your technology and your capital. And then this part, this oil, you and we can share it under some arrangement, some part where they can negotiate how much, who gets what. So as I said, these are some recent developments in the oil business. I'm bringing you up to date, okay? Let me wipe this so it dries up while I'm talking about the next subject. Mm -hmm. 
I hope you're not having any problem following this. It's so simple and straightforward that I've made this whole thing. There is also, we're talking about concerns of the company towards the government. I'm talking about geology or lack of it. Another one is number two, is database. D as in David, A. T is in table A, base, database, B A S E. Very, very important for the company. Database. Write it down. That means. Has there been any exploration of production activity in the past in this country? Is there a data available that we can look back and look at it and see well, whether they want to use that data and go forward? Very important. Or whether we will start everything from scratch? They want to know what kind of data is available. How much would it cost us to get the data? It's got a cost involved. What is the quality of the data? Is it any good quality? Can we access the data? A C C E S S. Can we access? Can we reach the data? Where is it? Is the data in one place or scattered all over the various ministries and departments of the government? Give an idea of what data we're talking about. We're not only talking about Technical data, yes, we are talking about technical or geological data. We talk about what kind of taxes are here, how to get our equipment from the port, how much customs duty we have to pay at the port for bringing our equipment. What is the cost of electricity here? And on and on and on. What was the rental thing about setting up an office here? How long will it take for us to set up an office? In some countries, it's very difficult to set up telephone lines and office, not everything like the United States. All these constitute data. Is it at a central place in the quality and the cost? So if the team of the most returners who go as an advanced party to a country X, and they go to one department of the government to look for data on taxation and another department of the government to look for geology related data and so on. One thing I can tell you, they are, government while they're supposed to help the country develop by giving data readily, I don't know why they sit on it. It's not that way. I wish they, it were that way. They should, that's the job, the government to share the data. If they sit on it, I don't know why they sit on it. There could be 100 reasons. If we want to have a control over you, if they give you the data, they don't have any control over you. You have the data, you don't care about them anymore. I can't imagine what's in their mind. This is important for the company. Not the geology, can I get to know the, what they had done in the past? One way to settle this issue is for governments to make themselves attractive, can be referred to as one shop, one stop shopping, one stop shot, shopping, one stop. Now we're talking shopping here, folks. One stop shopping.
Let's start with one stop shop. In case of one stop shopping, government puts all the data at one place, all of it for custom duty, taxes, electricity, telephone, geology, geophysics, is a package. So the companies can come and they normally can charge whatever they want to charge for the package of information. Okay, and then that point, the company can charge. And the government can charge and they give the package and the company can take, go home and study it there. Otherwise, the engine for return is go back and forth between the country and the company, not a good thing to do. You get expensive traveling and staying in hotels endlessly. So that's another thing we underestimate the importance is the availability of data and the cost of retaining it and the quality of the data. I'm not talking anything technical here, it's just common sense. Now, what about the stability of the government? Number three item, it is of concern to the company, the host country stability. Many kinds of things come to mind. Economic stability. In that regard, that would be inflation. Inflation. Very high or low. Of course, they will talk about employment and unemployment availability of professionals in the country, smart engineers, smart geologists, smart economists, smart accountants. If they bring their own from their country, that's gonna be expensive. That's another concern. Has this government, uh, let me slow down, you're writing, so I have to be very careful to let you write. I could write myself, but that will take a lot of time. The government is to be very careful for the stability of the government. It's, now, the company has to be careful and evaluate the stability of the government. How long has this government been in power? Is it been a long time or is it teetering, meaning shaky government? Tomorrow they may be thrown out by the opposition. That is a very dangerous thing because if this government signs a contract with me, the oil company, after a long stretch of negotiation over months, and the government is thrown out, you don't have a leg to stand on. The next government is not, should, but they may or may not abide by the agreement. They say, no, I don't care. The agreement with the old guys. Those guys were corrupt. You, you, you know, I'm just making up story. No, I'm not saying everybody's corrupt here. Now, of course, don't get me wrong. You bribed them. I don't know. They can make an excuse. No, no. We will have to renegotiate the whole thing. Do you want to renegotiate the whole thing? So the stability of the government is vital. It's easy to for stability, but I'm just giving you. And we talk about legal framework. Remember, go back is firmly based, tested, remember? Widening the, low, uh, the, the soccer game we were talking about. So there's so many things besides having good geology, 
the, the company is afraid when uh, not afraid they have to evaluate before going to a certain nation and particularly now i think i said it in my opening lecture i don't remember everything i said in that opening lecture because these are just coming like this so i don't keep a list of things of what uh, you know i do there is a list of things of course there's a list right there but sometimes i just like to you know loosen up and talk other than that list because as i talk i expand especially now i said the governments have to be very careful and make their contracts very very attractive to foreigners coming in because and oil particularly because remember i gave you the soviet union has opened up and kazakhstan is six times the size of france and next to kazakhstan is caspian sea caspian sea No, no, I'm sorry. It's uh, uh, Caspian Sea. The reason I said Caspian, we're going to talk about the Caspian Sea, because is Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan uh, on the west of the Caspian Sea, Kazakhstan, the east of the Caspian. A lot of area, big area, but a lot of oil being produced there, the oil and gas. So many countries have opened up more acreage. Brazil has opened up more acreage. Previously, no, everybody had to be. Mexico is opening up. These countries are opening up and asking companies to come and look for. So the, the government have to be aware, you know, what's the other guy doing? How, why should I go here and he goes, no, no, that's going on. It's competition there, folks. I mentioned that uh, then I can go on and on. Talking about the Caspian Sea. <clears throat> the question I ask everybody. I think I may have asked you in early on in the lecture, maybe the first one. It's called International Petroleum Concession Agreements Lecture. Please look up the world map. It's international. It's global. We're going to circle the globe. So in that is a place called Caspian Sea, and there's a Black Sea, and the Sea of Marmara, and all these seas over there. So please, when you listen to my lecture, when this time, open up the map and see where is the Caspian Sea. And why is it important that we talk about it? Goodness, it just came that I think I should, you know, I was talking about something else. And now oh, this is an important area they should be familiar with because this is where you're going to be probably headed to before long in your professional life. I wouldn't be surprised if you don't get a job there in the 5, 10, 15 years or at a big post. Uh, position there. So you can see, I've just thought of this, this would be nice to, for them to know. So let me then give you an idea and I'll unite and I'll attach this to the United Nations, very important. UNCLOS, remember UNCLOS? United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. If you have, I'm, I'm going to talk about it. If I didn't, maybe in another, sometimes some part, a small, might 5% of the lectures uh, overlap with the finance, the finance overlap with this. So, so Sometimes I forget, but did I like to this? But there's only five, four, five percent. There's no harm if I said this here, there. And generally, they are, they are, they are distinctly different, the two courses. Let me tell you where is the Caspian Sea, why is it important for the oil business, and then give you a homework. Stop writing with the thing. Oh my goodness, I do Let's see if I can. Mm -hmm. Not very much good. I'll try this. Maybe I'll get some other ink here. Maybe you can see that. But then now in the next lecture, I'll probably go back to, there's not so many offices, there's only one, two stations, Home Depot and Staples. I've tried one, I'll try the other one. Maybe I can pick some more so I can after every lecture, I can throw these away and find this tip. This is the tip. Good enough, so let's see. Yeah, I hope you agree. 
So this is the Caspian Sea. Let me write it on. You read it? I hope you can. C A S P I A N Caspian. Look up in the map. Before the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1990, there were only two countries, too, that surrounded the Caspian Sea. Only two. One was USSR. And USSR. Up to here. Okay, let's do this. All this area up from here up to here, all of this area, forget the lines, you know, the lines are not helping us. This is the Caspian Sea. All this area, all the board right here, you know, the vast area is called the USSR. And here, this area, this area of the Caspian Sea coastline is Iran. So break up, before the break of the Soviet empire, all this portion around the Caspian Sea was under the jurisdiction of USSR. And only this little part was under the jurisdiction of Iran. Remember that. After the Caspian Sea, after the break of the Soviet Union, there is no Soviet Union now, you know that. There have been new countries, republics that have been come about. In new Caspian Sea. Five new countries, republics have come out of the old Soviet Union. No, 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 the four new, the, no, the 15 new republics or countries have come out of the former Soviet Union, 15. Four out of the 15 are surrounding the Caspian Sea, plus Iran, the old, sorry, makes it five countries around the Caspian Sea now. Before that, the breakup, there were only two, Iran and USSR. That's what I'm trying to say. Here is Iran, one country. Write it down. Turkmenistan, another country. And Pakistan. Kazakhstan is another country. Russia. And Azerbaijan. Look up on the... These are... Four republics 
new. Tur this is you. Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Azerbaijan, plus Iran. There are now five countries that are around the uh, Caspian Sea. Two, five now. Now, this, and let me write in Kasha again. Well, I'll, we'll talk about that. Caspian Sea has become a very attractive area, the middle in the Caspian Sea, okay, for oil exploration and production. Kazakhstan, I told you, is a big country. You can see it's got a big area around the sea coast. Russia, oh my goodness, 10 plus million barrels of oil per day. Azerbaijan, a lot of oil, but not as big as Russia. Iran, a lot of oil, big producer. Turkmenistan, a lot of gas, not oil, gas. Turkmenistan. So this becomes a very hot area for oil exploration production around the Caspian. So after the pro breakup of the Soviet Union, these countries started claiming parts of the Caspian Sea is theirs. For example, remember, I, and if you don't, I'll repeat now, and maybe I talk to them in finance classes. There is a law of the sea called UN L -O -S, UNCL, UNCLOS, United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, which establishes the 200 mile of the sea from the coast into the sea, Gulf of Mexico somewhere, as the jurisdiction of the country. So, America extends 200 miles, Mexico extends 200 miles. I think I gave you the example of Norway and, and UK uh, overlapping. So that is what is happening. That is, each one of these countries are claiming that their jurisdiction is extending into the Caspian Sea by 200 miles. By the way, there's a field called Kashigan, K A S H K A S H A G A N, one of the largest oil fields in the world discovered in the last 20 years. Kashigan, K A S H A G A N, Kashigan. In the Caspian, over here, the Kalak area, right here. So, a big problem has arisen because now Caspian Sea is a very prolific with oil and gas possibilities. So some countries out of the five here, say the Caspian Sea is not a sea, it is a lake. Others say, no, it is not a lake, it is a sea. This has become a very serious question in the international oil business, whether it is a sea or a lake. Even today, they have not been able to uh, agree on what to call it. Lake or a sea, very serious question. Normally I would give this as a homework to students like you. Say, so you tell me what is it, think about it, and next time we meet, we talk about it. And there's a lot of discussion, okay, half an hour discussion. I'll just tell you the answer. You see, we can really spend a lot of time if we're in place, back and forth, back and forth. And the course could be very big, could be started in six months, more, eight months, rather than the congested, you know, two, three hour lectures occasionally. Because the problem is, if it is a lake or a sea is the question. One country says it's a lake, 
The other one in surrounding Cristiano no, is a sea. What's the difference? If it is a sea and they call it a sea, and today, even today, the five countries have not been able to agree what to call it. They have had summit meetings in the last 30 years since the breakup of the Soviet Union to decide, they still can't decide. You know what is a summit is when meeting is when the heads of the government or the state meet to decide. These are big meetings. Because when Putin meets with the uh, Kazakhstan president, used to be Sultan Nazarbayev, and, and I used to name all of these guys by name. No, I don't know them. I read in the newspaper. And the Azerbaijan president was Aliyev. Uh, Iran was a Khomeini representative. You know, we've had different prime ministers there and so on. I think used to be in Turkmenistan was a fellow named Muhammadov. He's died now. The point here is these presidents have been meeting there for many years and they cannot decide what to call it. It's a serious matter. And that's, so what do you call it? Well, and I open up, you young people, you know, you, you know, you tell us. The thing is, if it is a Caspian, it's a sea. And if the country has a big coastline, this example, let's say, Coastline like Russia, coastline Russia, they can claim 200 miles into the sea. Iran has a small coastline, small, there 200 miles can go like this. So Iran would want to call it not a sea, but Russia may want to call it a sea. So they, they, they got a coastline and they can go this way in the coastline, 200 miles. Iran has to stay closer here. So, they did not agree for all the years. Finally, they said that all five countries cannot agree on what to call it. I'll tell you about the lake problem in a minute. So, we will let Kazakhstan, the neighbor, decide with its neighbor, Russia, what to call it. Kazakhstan should not worry about what Iran calls it. They're too far out of the way. So Russia decide what Azerbaijan calls it. So they become bilateral neighbor. But these two guys, Kazakhstan and Russia decide what to call it. Russia and this guy Azerbaijan decide not to have one single agreement what to call it by all five, because we can't agree. Mm -hmm. Some call it lake, some call it... Now what's the problem? Because with the sea, you see jurisdiction goes way up there if you have a big coastline. If you have a small coastline, how far can you go? Two miles like a little strip. Those who believe it's a lake and not a sea, the law of the sea will not apply, obviously. And then you say, what will apply? According to the one we took a short course, there. it's called the condominium approach. Condominium, C O N C O N D O, condo. Minium, M I N I M U M, condominium. Condo, like a condo. You, many people live in condos, condominium. Half the people in New York live in condominiums. In fact, now even Austin, Texas look like half the people downtown are living in condominiums. It's a big building. And each one has a flat or a condominium, same thing. Flat, condominium, same thing. In some countries call it flat, some countries call it common. So what is a condominium? Let's talk about that. Again, I would discuss in the class, what is it? I'll tell you. Condominium is like in a building or, or there are many owners, there are many, each owner has his own apartment or a condo in the building. But there are common facilities that everybody can use. For example, if there's an elevator, all the folks in the building can use it. If there's a parking, maybe they can use common parking, tennis court, swimming pool, all these are common areas. 
equally shared. You can't say, well, you have a bigger, more expensive condominium, therefore, you know, you can only have four guys in the elevator, I can have only one. It doesn't work like that. So those with a shorter coastline say, well, it's a condominium, therefore, condominium. Therefore, all five of us there will have an equal amount of jurisdiction, all five. Forget the coastline and the United Nations here. So we will all have 100 total resources divided by five. So we will all have 20% share in the Caspian Sea, 20%, one fifth. Forget the United Nations. So the point here is, I'm opening your mind. Opening, are you as engineer going to be work? I, I don't know, maybe you will, I, I doubt it. It's a legal international law coming in here, but no harm you are getting involved. They may ask uh, uh, the expertise of a petroleum engineer or a geologist. What do you think of the resources? Where are the resources? Where are the data? You know, where are the, uh, uh, the trap, the, the, the stratigraphic or structural trap in, uh, in the geology area? So, uh, so, but it's nice for you to know this. I would have discussed it if time had allowed a little bit later in the course, but since it came about logically, I thought I'll throw that in. Let us move on to yet another definition of the word lease, L-E-A-S-E, -E, not license. That's a permission to do certain things. Lease, L-E-A-S. For an area that you're allowed to look for oil somewhere, it's just a lease, you sign a lease to look for oil at a certain area. Please. More, in almost every country in the world, where, where oil is found in that country, automatically, that oil or gas belongs to the people of that country. It belongs to the citizens of the country, all the revenue coming to, coming to the citizens and the government is there to represent the citizens and to collect their share of the revenues on behalf of the national citizens of the country, so automatically. If it is a kingdom or a queendom, I don't know, I can't speak for all of them. Generally what I hear is, I could be wrong, under the law of that country, that lease, that oil belongs, coming from that certain area of the country, it belongs to the king or the queen. I'm not saying I'm swearing to every law of every country what it is, but generally what I hear is that that legally belongs to the king or the queen. But as in other countries, it's, the people. Well, what about the United States? We are different. We are different in many ways. Offshore land, oh no, there's no land off. The offshore areas of the United States of Gulf of Mexico, offshore California, that offshore areas called OCS, Outer Continental Shelf, the offshore areas in the United States, I'm not talking about the country, here yeah, it's different. Only the off and are what? under the jurisdiction of the U.S. government. Offshore. It doesn't belong to any individual. Or if there's a, a state park, or it's a federal park, that we have big, huge national parks, huge national parks, millions of acres. Those two are the jurisdiction of the federal government. In other words, what does that mean? If I want to look for oil in the Gulf of Mexico, I will go to the Department of the Interior that controls leases in the Gulf of Mexico, gives out leases in the Gulf of Mexico. However, 
and there's a department called MMS, Minerals Management Service. It used to be called Minerals Management Service. It's a division of the Department of the Interior of the US government. That's the department responsible for the giving out leases in the Gulf of Mexico is MMS, Minimal Mineral Management Service. Now let's talk about that. However, onshore is a different story. The oil resources onshore in the United States belong to the owner of that land. Very different. People overseas don't understand that. What does that mean, owner of that land? If I have 10,000 acres of land in, in Texas, 10,000 acres. Texas. If Exxon wants to look for oil on my land, my that's a ranch, they will have to come to me to get the lease, not the federal government. So in America, it, it, there are two kinds of leases that I can sign with them. There are two kinds of leases only in America. One is called, and write it down, surface lease. The other kind is called mining or mineral lease. Mining or mineral lease, different. In America, we can separate the two. That means I can, Exxon can come to me and say, I want to drill oil here in your land. I can say, okay, I'll sign a lease with you, but only give you the surface rights, not the, the, not the mineral rights. Interesting. Unusual, that's America. That means you, Exxon, can only, are you only entitled to surface rights? And not what is under the surface. Why would Exxon want just surface right and not what's underneath? What do you need 10,000 acres for? Question in a discussion. Interesting discussion in the classroom. We can engage in that. For example, you can go agriculture, you can grow a crop, wheat, rice. You can grow, have cattle grazing on the surface, can you not? This one kind of this only use the surface. And the other one is where Exxon can come to me and say, no, 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 no. I don't want your surface. I don't care. Let anybody use it, graze the cattle. Okay. I want the mineral rights. That was under the surface the minerals, I want to drill to find the oil there. And if I find the oil, I'll give you a royalty. So the federal government will not get the royalty. I, Dr. Malik, will get the royalty. Okay. Very unusual. So an individual like me or you or whoever has that land in Texas or Louisiana or, <coughs> or Oklahoma can separate the two surface to this guy mineral to this guy. There could be two separate companies doing two different things on this, on, uh, in the, in, on the land. One goes to look for oil, the other one goes for grazing of cattle or something like that. Grow, grow something. Grow, as I said, wheat or rice or whatever they want to grow, or cotton. 
Very interesting, isn't it? That's the American way. We often talk about, or not often, we, you may have heard that the University of Texas is among the richest universities in the whole world. It's not far from the truth. Well, Harvard has got more endowment, but we are close to there. How did we become so rich? I really don't know, but there is a story that I heard. I hope it is correct, but I'll tell you, you can accept or reject, or you can investigate, find out if there's any, any truth to that. About why, how we become rich. Again, I'm trying, that's what I heard. That in 18, whenever, 1885, let's say, what, when this University of Texas was erected, when it was started as a public, it was started as a public, it still is a public university. It's not a private university, you know that. The state legislators, those are the legislators, the, the people who sit in this big dome, you know, the, you see the big dome in the, near the downtown, you know, if you look out to the south of this, you see that's the parliament, that's the state legislature sits there. In England, we call them the parliament, America, Washington is the Congress. Those people in sitting there, the legislators, 100 years ago, when they started the university, say, let's have a university. Somebody said, look, it is a good idea. How are we going to operate the university? Where's the money? And it was said, and it was right or wrong, that this West Texas area, area West, West Texas area, let's give the university that land doesn't grow anything there. Anyway, they will have some grazing of cattle and some money will come. What about you know, a million acres? I don't know how much acres there. And uh, they'll use that little money you know, to pay the university operating costs. That was an idea. Oh, not a bad idea. And what a God, God the Almighty. He, he smiled at the university. And guess what? They found oil there. And all the royalty goes to the University of Texas, some and some goes to a &M. That's the point. That's how we get a lot of money from there. I hope it is correct story. That's what happened. So, Federal government can sign a lease, individual can sign a lease, and also the University of Texas sign can assign. And they do. We have a big land department of the University of Texas system. You know, University of Texas has got many campuses, medical schools, and all like 15 or 14 or 15 there. That's called the system. This is one location in UT Austin. And they signed the, the lease with this University of Texas system. If Exxon wants to go look for oil in West Texas, that's where they go. Now, you might say, well, then me, me, you professors must be getting a lot of salary because there is a rate. No, we are not. Don't feel jealous of us. We're not. Because if I, the story is all a story. It said that, you know, in the fine print, that this land will be used for grazing cattle, what money comes to the University of Texas, no matter how much it is. And they said, but this money will not be used to pay the salaries of the Texas, of the faculty, you know, professors. So here we go, we could be the richest. Doesn't mean Dr. Malik gets all the money there. Again, take this for a grain of salt, right or wrong, I don't know, but either way, it sounds pretty interesting anyway. <laughs> to be ending the program. We've been sitting here, boy, goodness, almost two hours, I can't believe. Almost two hours, nonstop listening to me. So, uh, but then the question is, where will they spend the money? If not, give me the money, the teacher. On capital investment of projects, buildings, 
upon bit so they can spread. I think the University of Texas has got more buildings than Manhattan, if you ask me. That's where the money is going. I mean, I don't know. Is that the reason that I gave you? I've been to Harvard, I've been to MIT, I've been to Stanford, I've been to UCLA. No, 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 no. Berkeley, I'm going to be exact, you know, not to UCLA, I've been to Berkeley. People go on tour and all that stuff. No, I go tour to go look at university. I went to Hawaii, I went looking at the university there. Didn't go to the beach. I don't know if there's any university that has so many buildings and parking building for parking, my goodness. Anyway, so that's the story about the University of Texas, the surface and the mining business. Now it's, as I said, we play close to two hours nonstop and we haven't taken a break. We could have taken a break and we could have continued on and on, but that's not the point. We're not trying to catch a train. It's not mechanical and you have to, like a labor thing. It has to go in here. Speed has to be regulated, how much goes in and uh, how much can you relax? So much goes into teaching. So what I shall do now, I've taken, I have, I have a different, I have a decision to take. Because this brings about the end of part one of the four part course. And some of you say, oh, well, thank God. Part two, I thought maybe we'll start today, but I don't think we should and we will. And that is part two. Once I start, I'd like to continue as much as I can. For example, part two is made up of different types of agreements, starting with a concession. Number one, if you want to write it down. Production sharing agreement, PSA, or PSC, production sharing contract, joint ventures, service contracts. They will be taught in that sequence. When you go into a sequence, you don't break in the middle, especially not the first two. Certainly not the first, not concession, not production sharing. No, no. They will have to be taught together for reasons I will explain when I teach them to compare the two. They have to be sitting side by side. People don't get to see it side by side. They see concession, they see production, and you can't tell which is which and which is better and which for whom. So I would not do the same. I want to put them side by side in a way so you can see which and why should you do this versus that type of agreement. And that takes you part two. We'll start with the word royalty, not the royalty as you see in England or Denmark or Belgium. That's good. Don't be late for that. Very important. The word will be royalty. I could explain royalty now, but I would not because the back end of today's lecture, you're exhausted. And your head is kind of, oh, no more, please. I'd rather do it when it's fresh in your mind. It's very important. So royalty is critical to part two. So I'll explain. It's not difficult. But it would be the start of part two. Then we'll go to concession. And then when we do that, I'm going to just flash this on top of you, just show you. I will show you something that looks like this. And I want you to do this, whatever it is, don't worry about it. I'm not, it will come to you as an attachment. You'll have to figure out all these columns. Then I'll show you another one, similar to that, but this is, a cash flow based on one kind of an agreement. It's an attachment one. This is a cash flow based on another kind of agreement. The one was concession agreement, two was production sharing agreement. Then we'll talk about what's the difference. I know it's not important. You know, you're not going to 
to to look at these and uh, you're not going to be uh, doing it now because there's too much numbers so i'm going to next time when we meet the next lecture will have an attachment these will be attached in my next lecture so i'll give you 10 15 minutes maybe 30 minutes to look at this and calculate get you calculated so add and subtract no add subtract there's not one division needed here add subtract and multiply and this one I'll give you another 15 20 minutes so right here you can be working yourself once you finish this they'll go in a sequence then if we have the time then we move to the third type of agreement. You can see it's a joint operating agreement. So, and there are many pages of this, you know, there are many bad no. So these, these will come out as, as attachments. So don't worry about it at this time because I haven't said anything about it. So when I'm looking at the watch, when I'm closing in two hours, and, and the spirit, when I start this part has to continue, I think the best thing is, uh, into, uh, after two hours, we didn't take any break. Sometimes I said, let's take a 15 minutes break so we can easily quit early, no, not early, or it's almost time. And you folks have a good time. Thank you very much. End of the story. Okay, have a good day. Get ready for part two next time.